bones and clean water. This may seem a little confusing to you right now, but by the end of our time together today, this will make sense and you will understand what the global water crisis is, why we should solve it, and how you can help. So I'd like to start with the story of how I ended up here today talking to you about water. At the rather awkward age of 13, I had one of those critical life-changing experiences when I went on a school trip, to, uh, hiking and canoeing, to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area of Minnesota and Canada. Now my family was just telling me a couple of weeks ago that when I said I wanted to go on this trip, they thought I was crazy. They were thinking, Laura and bugs and outdoor toilets, no way. But off I went. And the trip actually turned out to be a little bit of a disaster. It ended up raining every single day. And so we spent the entire trip slogging through these muddy portages and canoeing through high waves with the rain splashing us in the face and the whole time in soggy shoes. So for a lot of the students on that trip, it was kind of a miserable experience and they were just trying to get through it until we could go home. But I found that I loved it. I loved being surrounded by the water and the lakes and the rain. On that trip, I found the magic of water. The magic of water that has been inspiring works of art and literature for years. The magic of water that makes children laugh when they splash around in it. You all know what that sounds like. And the magic of water that we all need to drink to survive. So when I went to graduate school, I thought, I'll research water. And this is what I was picturing, pretty liquids and pipettes and test tubes. And what I really ended up with was this. This is me in the basement of Carson Engineering Center, <laughs> sweating in my lab coat and my goggles, hammering these smelly cow bones into small pieces. Not quite what I had been envisioning. But this research actually turned out to be so much more than I ever imagined and ended up involving things like people and poverty and hope. My research focuses on drinking water quality in developing countries, and cow bones are a piece of that, but we'll come back to that later. I'd like to start by talking about the overall global water crisis and a couple of the things that contribute to it. So in the world right now, there are about 780 million people lacking access to safe drinking water. 780 million people. That's a big number to think about. So let's do this. It's been said that the average person in their life meets about 100,000 people. So think about your 100,000 people. And then think about combining your 100,000 people with the 100,000 of everyone else in this room. And if we put all of our people together, that still doesn't even come close to the amount of people living right now without safe drinking water. So that's also hard to comprehend what this looks like in someone's daily life, not to have safe water. So I'll share the story with you about how I first learned about this. When I started graduate school, my professor sent me to Tanzania to learn more about water. And one day we were in a Maasai community and we all sat down and had tea with some of the community members. And then when we were done with tea, I asked someone, could you tell us where your water source is that you use? And he said, yeah, no problem, it's just right over there. In fact, I'll take you myself. Now his definition of right over there and mine were a little different. But off we walked down the dusty path following the nice gentleman and 10 or 15 minutes later down the path, we run into this woman coming back from the water source with her donkey laden with buckets of water and another 10 or 15 minutes down the path, we get to the water source. This muddy river filled with cows is all the water this community has for bathing and cooking and drinking. And this is a problem because this is an unprotected water source. So obviously there's animal waste, there might be human waste, and anything else that's been dumped into this water, people are drinking. UNICEF estimates that 3,000 children die every day because of drinking unsafe water. And the kinds of things that are in this water, the microbes and the parasites, are contributing to those deaths. Here's a very different example of what it looks like not to have access to safe water. This is Ethiopia. This is a protected water source, so the water coming out here is safe to drink. And lots of people are utilizing this water source. 
But what you can't see in this picture, and what we couldn't see when we were standing there looking at it, are any homes close by. So how far are these women and these young girls walking to collect water and then lugging it back home? In lots of places, women and girls spend hours, hours every day collecting water. And so the women are not able to engage in economic activities to improve the livelihoods of their families. And the girls are not able to go to school. And in some places, that trip to collect water isn't even safe. And they risk attack and harassment on their trip every day. And here's a final very different example of what it can look like not to have safe water. Sometimes you get a water source that's close to home, and it's a protected source that should be safe. But you actually end up with chemicals coming out of the ground naturally occurring in that water. Things you can't see or taste or smell like fluoride and arsenic. So a lot of my research focuses on fluoride, so let's talk about that for a second. We add fluoride in our water in very small concentrations to strengthen our teeth and prevent cavities. But at high concentrations, you get health effects. So this young man in India has dental fluorosis. And we've learned from colleagues in several countries that the problem with this is that there's a social stigma attached to it. And so people that have dental fluorosis may not be able to get married or get jobs in public service that they're looking for. And the other thing you get is skeletal fluorosis. This young boy in India has bowed legs as a result of fluoride. And you get bone deformities and pain and limited range of motion. And that can prevent people every day from doing the things they need to do to care for their families or to earn a living. So all three of these things, chemicals in water, contaminated polluted water, and long trips to collect water, all contribute to the larger global water crisis. So now that we've talked about what the crisis is, I'd like to share with you the exciting things that happen when we start to solve this problem. So when I talk about the water statistics, they're a little overwhelming. And I usually get one of two responses from people. The first is that people say, but we have all these problems in our own community, in the US, in our own backyards. Shouldn't we focus on solving these problems and maybe not worry so much about problems across the world? Now this is a valid point. We do have problems in the US right here, even water-related problems. But Martin Luther King Jr. once said, whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And so the same way that that drop of water causes a ripple effect that goes far beyond the drop itself, that's the same thing that happens when a community gets access to safe water. And let me give an example of what that might look like. So if a community gets access to safe water, this young girl now gets to go to school because she has the time. And her education doesn't just affect her, it affects her family and her children and her grandchildren far into the future. Her family now, with safe water, has less illness, and so they have more time and more money to devote to improving their home or expanding their economic livelihood. Their community now, with safe water, begins to grow and develop faster. And maybe they start solving other problems, such as getting access to electricity or to toilets. And as the smaller communities grow and develop faster, that branches out to the larger communities and eventually ends up affecting the entire country. And you all know how globalization works. Things that affect the economic and political stability of one country eventually end up affecting everyone. And so we all have a reason to want to solve this global water crisis. The other response that I often get to the water crisis is people say, that's really awful. I wish I could do something, but I'm not an engineer or a philanthropist. There's nothing I can do to help solve this problem. Now that response is humble and understandable, but I don't believe it's true. I've been studying the water crisis for almost seven years, and I know that it's complicated and massive and diverse. And there is a role that everyone can play in helping to solve it. In fact, even cows can help. So I promised I would come back to those smelly cow bones. But first, I have to make a small confession. I'm really afraid of cows. <laughs> well, you laugh, but here's why. So in a lot of the communities that we visited to study fluoride, the cows look like this. 
They have these big horns, and they just roam around wherever they please with no fence and no one really watching them. So I watch them. And I can tell you there are lots of them. So while I don't really appreciate this, it's actually really good. Because years ago, someone figured out that if you take cow bones and char them in just the right way, and crush them, and filter water through them, they actually will remove fluoride from water. How amazing that something as simple as charred animal bones can actually help make water safer to drink. And in some communities where they don't have access to safe water, they also have a lot of poverty. And so the fact that those darn cows are all over the place is actually good because it means that solution is locally available and inexpensive. And the other cool thing about this bone char is that the fact that it's so surprisingly good at removing fluoride from water has inspired us as researchers to figure out why. What are those properties of the char that makes it so good at removing fluoride? And then what else can we find or produce that will also work? Because not every community is willing or able to utilize fluoride to treat, or excuse me, bone char to treat their water. So now I've told you how cows can help, but let's talk about how you can help. In the water community, there's a lot of discussion about failure. Wonderful projects or wells are implemented, but they're not always sustainable in the long term. For example, in Africa, in the last couple of years, it's estimated that 200,000 wells have been implemented and then failed. And you can imagine how much time and money has been wasted and how many people were drinking water from a well and then had to go back to their muddy river. And so to solve this problem, to implement solutions in a highly sustainable way, requires a lot of different people. For example, let's, let's say that a community wants to work with us to remove fluoride from their water. So one of the first things we would want to do is have social scientists like anthropologists or psychologists go in and talk to the community and find out what they want, what they would use, what they value to make sure that that system is appropriate to the community. And once that's determined, then we need scientists and engineers to come in and figure out how to set the system up and make sure that the water that's coming out at the end really is safe to drink. And then we need business people to come in and set up a supply chain to make sure that there are replacement parts available and that there's a repair network so that someone can do the maintenance on the system. All sorts of people are needed to make these solutions sustainable. And beyond this specific example, the water crisis itself needs lots of people to do all sorts of things. People to raise money, people to lobby for government change, and people to remind all of us that having access to safe water is not something we should take for granted. So I'd like to wrap up today with a couple of examples of people, local people and organizations that are doing really wonderful things to help solve this problem. I'll start with the Water Center right here at OU. The Water Center is doing what we just talked about, putting together interdisciplinary teams of people to work on solving issues of fluoride and arsenic. Another example is Steve Stewart. Steve was one of the guys that helped to get a local organization in Oklahoma City that drills wells around the world off the ground. Steve has a really interesting background story. His education is in industrial psychology, and his experience is in designing and manufacturing furniture. But when Steve got inspired to help with the water crisis, he actually ended up designing a hand drilling method and inventing a simple and affordable well pump that was based on designs by Leonardo da Vinci and Samuel Moreland. And that well pump is now in use in over 1,500 communities around the world. Another local example is artist Nathan Pratt. Nathan used to spend a lot of his time doing chainsaw carvings for people. And then at one point, he came up with a new idea to utilize his Native American heritage and running water to develop a new kind of water sculpture. And then when Nathan learned about the water crisis, he realized he could actually take those sculptures and use them to raise money and awareness for the water crisis. So these are just a couple of examples of people doing things that they're passionate about to help solve a piece of the problem. 
So whether we're talking about a child splashing around in water or a child walking to collect water, water is magical and we all need it to survive. So as you leave this extraordinary event today, inspired by the speakers and performers, I'd like you to stop and take a moment and think about when and how you experience the magic of water in your life and then do something to help. I've listed some organizations up here. You can look them up online or follow them on social media to learn more. You can support a water organization or conserve water in your own lives or share about the problem with friends and family. Any one of hundreds of things that you can do in your life. But going back to that equation that we started our time together with, we can substitute in or out any technology that treats water for those bones. But the missing piece of that equation is you. You have the power to do something in your life to share the magic of water with others. Thank you.